today, but we're actually talking about uh, yeah, climate crisis. So Steve is gonna first tell us how mainstream economists think, how they approach, and why they are wrong, wrong about that. And after we will have a, a short meal break for maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we will yeah. serve pizza and beer. And afterward, uh, we'll come back and Steve will um, give him a short workshop of how Minsky model might be a better approach for a uh, financial crisis, uh, climate crisis. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Steve King. It's quite a nice reception, both in terms of tone and the number of people here. So um, I'm very pleased. And I've, I'll, I've, I'm going to go through some pretty technical stuff. This is not going to be a I hate economics because it has mathematics in it. Uh, it's, my reason, actually, is I hate economics because it has mathematics in it. The stuff they do, they call mathematical, uh, it's nonsense. Most of my physicist friends, when they take a look at it, say, you've got to be kidding, and I'll show you why as I go through. Now, of course, uh, how, how well is that screen readable at the back there, by the way? Is it easy enough to read? The good, great, okay. Uh, so this was back in 2018, of course, that William Nordhaus was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics. How many know... Uh, a quick, quick question. Is the Nobel Prize in economics a Nobel Prize? Okay, and most of you know, okay. It was invented by the Swedish Central Bank in 1969. Uh, it partly it looks like a political struggle in Switzerland over neoliberal economics versus a more uh, progressive uh, social, social democracy movement, and it's legitimised economics ever since, despite the family screaming that they don't want to have Nobel's name associated with this. And I've known about this for a long time, but for me, the last straw, shortly after I, I re-equated myself with Nordhaus's work, was the fact they gave the prize to Nordhaus. Now, here's a key slide in Nordhaus's speech, and it says, temperature trajectories in different policies. Okay? And notice he has, or, or I'll just change the point here, a, a number of different routes. Uh, one is the one that uh, Extinction Rebellion is pushing for down here. And this one here, he labels optimal with a four degree increase in temperature over pre-industrial levels by 2140. Now, in what sense could that be optimal? Okay. Uh, well, it might make life in Amsterdam a bit better during winter. That's so long as Amsterdam was above water. Uh, but according to him, it was um, optimal because it minimised the sum of the costs of climate change plus the cost of abatement. Of course, if you do nothing, there's zero abatement cost in whatever climate change does to the economy. If you do a lot more, he said, well, yes, you can reduce the damages in the temperature level, but it's going to cost you. So if no abatement, he said the base cost would give us a temperature greater than six degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the net present values of that, he reckoned, would be $23 trillion. That's a lot of money, about the size of the American economy. But it's not extinction, is it? Cost of abatement zero, so total cost 23 trillion. The optimal, he said, was a temperature of plus four over pre-industrial levels. Damages of about 15 trillion, so all these abatement costs would reduce damages by of the order of eight trillion, about less than half a year's output by the American economy. Cost would be three, three trillion, so that was the cheapest of the options. The base, the optimal, less than two degrees, etc., etc. So the sum of the two was 18 trillion. So that, that's why it was the best. It cost you 19 trillion to do two degrees, and it wasn't worth it. Yeah. So he's just he's looking into the next 100 or 200 years. 150 right? years. 100 I, ironically, when he got he got his name by trashing the work of the limits to growth study back in 1972. Whereas actually he trashed the predecessor, which was uh, uh, called, uh, called the world uh, world economic model uh, by um, Jay Forrest, who's one of the world's great engineers, and I truly mean the word great. Uh, and Forrester had done a, 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 a basic model that became the limits of growth from the third iteration. And he came out with a paper called Measurement Without Data, critiquing the paper. Uh, he didn't understand the model. That was obvious. Forrester wrote a reply which destroyed his reply, but it was published in an obscure journal, not one of the economics journals where Nordhaus's work was published. And as one part of that, he, he rubbished them for making projections 100 years in the future. Look what he does later. So uh, six months before he gave that paper, climate scientists have become moderately well acquainted with electronically over the last couple of months, Will Steffen, and about 16 co-authors, by the way. That's important because you'll see a, 
an asshole called Troll that I'll talk to about later here, rubbishing him for his single paper. There were 16 authors in this paper. There's an enormous range of skills behind this paper. But giving a paper in Australia, where he's now based, Will Stefan made this comment about a four degree Celsius world. First of all, most of the tropics will be too hot for human habitation. Tropics and subtropics, so forget about most of Asia. Okay. Even probably a fair bit of Australia. Uh, and down the bottom, maximum carrying capacity of the planet is about 1 billion people versus 7.5 billion now. Those are two rather different visions, aren't they? Can you square them? Well, most people, and I'm, I was in this category as well, who were aware of the damage level that, that Nordhaus predicted, thought it was due to having a huge discount rate. One of my friends in the area uh, wrote to me saying it's just because the discount rate is too high. I said back, no, it's not Irene. It's something much worse than that. They're calculating completely different measures of damages themselves. They're not using the data they get from climate scientists and then putting in those, those expectations for damage into um, summing functions, working out a net present value and discounting. They're not doing that. They're making their own numbers up. And I literally say numbers making the numbers up because they've got bugger all to do with climate change. Uh, one of the, the way that I mainly focus on today is what I thought was the most outrageously stupid element of the way they made these numbers up and that was they thought, they guessed, that they could simply take current day data about GDP and temperature in different regions, do a, a fit of that relationship and it's a pretty weak relationship. Temperature is, climate is not the main determinant of income today, it's social class, it's the culture you came from, it's the countries you've conquered in the past, etc, etc. The temperature is moderately important, particularly when you restrict yourself to one country, and most of these studies were initially done just using United States data. They said that that, that relationship between GDP and temperature today can be used to predict the impact of climate change over time. Now, when, when I first saw that, um, I've got a, I own a place here, I'm a resident of the UK, but I have a, own a flat in Amsterdam, and uh, my girlfriend came up to me to, give, to bring a drink to me, and I was working on on, uh, on this research, and I had my head in my hands. I said, literally, holy shit, if this is what politicians have been taking seriously, and it is what politicians look at, they don't really read what the climate scientists write. They tell their researcher to turn to the summary of the section on economics, what does it say, and then that's what they react to. This stuff was getting into the international uh, intergovernmental policy on climate change. They were writing the IPCC report. So all the stuff by the scientists, pretty much ignored by the politicians, this section by the economists taken seriously. So I had my head in my hands, and she walked in with a drink to me, she's actually, she's Thai, Thai Buddhist, and speaks in a very staccato English, and she said to me, why are, you, why are you upset? And I said, I'm just doing this work on climate change. Oh, you're crazy, why are you bother working on that stuff? Nobody, nobody wants to read about it. Uh, you can't do anything to change it. If we die, we die. Beautifully, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, okay. A very Buddhist summary of our situation living completely in the moment. But I was still horrified and I remain horrified by what they've done. So what they did, they took data on today's temperature data today and, in, and income data today, starting mainly with regions in the United States. I'm, I'm, and I'll use an illustration using states in the moment. And they found a weak quadratic relationship between temperature and GDP. Quadratic was arbitrary, by the way. There's no reason why you had to pick a quadratic function, just what they used. And they assume that same relationship is going to hold as the enormous increase in energy in the biosphere occurs as we put a blanket over the planet by using CO2. Now, my analogy, I haven't actually developed this yet, I want to do this as a, as a graphical analogy, but climate change is a bit like having a pot of, of, of soup on the stove with some funny chemicals in it and then putting a lid on the pot. Okay? That's what's really going on. These guys don't even understand that. Uh, but you're going to the massive increase in energy, and they thought you could just extrapolate it out of what they found in current data between different regions of the, of the planet today. So this is out of uh, the, not the first paper to do this, this is probably the second or third. The climate functions were quadratic in nature. Countries that are cooler than optimal are predicted to benefit from warming, so we're going to do our okay cow here. It might be a bit wet. Okay. Countries that happen to be warmer than optimal are predicted to be harming by warming. And this study looked at a 2.5 degree increase in temperature and said they implied benefits of 145 billion per year from a 2.5 degree increase in temperature. 
given this relationship. Now, what I've done here, just for the heck of it, I've embedded this data in the plots. If anyone wants to have a play, they can do it themselves. You can't see it, of course, at that scale. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, taking each state in America, its average temperature in Celsius degrees, GDP per capita and population, and then out of that, making a, an estimate of what's the average population in the America and what's the average temperature, and then getting that scatter plot. So this is the scatter plot. Okay? You could fit anything you bloody well like <laughs> through that. Okay? That's me fitting, forcing a quadratic on it. And out of that I got a coefficient. This is actually working. The vertical axis is uh, GDP per capita by state as a deviation from the average for the United States as a whole. Contiguous states, not including Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, and then the bottom is the difference in temperature from the average, which is I think about uh, I think it's about 12 or 13 degrees Celsius, average temperature. So whether it's a bus plus or a minus above that temperature level. And what I got out of it was a quadratic with a coefficient of minus 131. And that gave me a correlation of minus 0.35, saying a temperature increase was associated, generally speaking, with a fall in GDP. $131, okay, per head times temperature difference squared. That's the relationship. So I then just made a little uh, plot of that, and I compared it to Nordhaus's the function Nordhaus actually used in the most recent version of his paper in 2018. Now he and his morons, pardon me, colleagues have put an enormous amount of effort into pulling out numbers from all sorts of different areas. They've done studies across different countries, they've done surveys of experts, uh, those experts include Larry Summers, um, and, and they've put all the stuff together and fitted a quadratic, as it has in, in Nordhaus's case, to a number of data points. This is me doing once in a, it took me about a half an hour to do this work, so I reckon it's worth a Nobel Prize, don't you reckon? It's pretty close. He says a, one, uh, a two degree increase in temperature will cause a 1% fall in GDP. Oh, that should be minus, by the way. I forgot to put minus signs in front of his numbers there. Mine are all minus down the bottom. I got minus 0.2%, which is, by the way, one of the numbers you'll find in the 2014 IPCC report. The range of damage prediction from minus 0.2 to minus 2% in GDP. If you go up further, I get pretty damn close at an eight degree increase, not too far away at a six degree increase. Four degrees, maybe half as much as the is saying, but and at ten degrees, I'm spot on. So my my half an hour of work ended up giving me pretty much the same sort of prediction as Nordau's got a Nobel Prize for. Okay. Well, it all depends on whether the assumption is correct. Okay. And don't you think if you had an assumption on which your conclusion actually depended, you'd check it? What economists do all the time is they tell you we're making a simplifying assumption. Now, a simplifying assumption for me, for example, is that there are no canals between here and where I rode because my bicycle doesn't go into the canal unless I make a bloody awful turn. Okay, you could have a map of Amsterdam for bicycles with no mention of the canals. Okay, the fact that 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 is not a simple that is a simplifying assumption to leave the canals out because I put the map canals on the map, nothing changes. Okay. It's just making the map less complicated. That is a simplifying assumption. An assumption that what we get out of temperature and GDP today will apply in the future is not a simplifying assumption. If the assumption is wrong, your results are crap. And these are crap results. Now, you have already had this debate, I'm sure, in the classes. Can you criticise a model for its assumptions? What do you call this? Have you had that question asked in classes yet? Is it valid to criticise a model for its assumptions? What do they tell you? Yeah. It's just a model. Huh? It's just a model. It's just a it's model. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore the assumptions. Let's see if it fits the data. That's all that matters. Well, this is what Friedman had to say that most of those stupid comments you get from your lecturers are based on. Truly important hypotheses were found to have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate descriptions of reality. And in general, the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumption. This is called the F twist. It has F for Friedman, named by Paul Samuelson of all people who's done a few f twists himself in his time. But they were rubbishing it, and there's a beautiful paper um, by uh, a guy called Musgrave, Alan Musgrave, classifying assumptions into three types, what he calls uh, sim generally simplifying assumptions, so stuff when you leave it out, it doesn't matter, it's just leaving out canals for a cycle map of Amsterdam. Okay. Um, what he calls domain assumptions, saying if, you are, if this assumption is correct, 
then your theory applies. If the assumption is not correct, your theory does not apply. Now, in that sense, this is a domain assumption. Now, assumption like that is okay if you go to the next stage, where you say, once you've done that, it's a, what you call a heuristic assumption. You make it for a while, and then you show that it's false, and show the consequences of changing it. That was how Einstein, for example, explains the theory of special relativity. Okay? Or speak general relativity, but both of them, the use of that sort of idea. This assumption is not true in the next stage of the theory. I relax it and see what happens, and then I get the general and the special theories of relativity. Uh, they didn't get that far. And I had this all the time when I, when I throw my approach to economics to a mainstream audience. Uh, this happened when I was followed out of a... Uh, I had a fight with a, a young PhD graduate from the Western American Association conference about a decade ago. Uh, and he followed me out of the room afterwards and saying over my shoulder, well, we have to make some simplifying assumptions. And I just shouted back saying, mate, you've got to learn the difference between a simplifying assumption and a fantasy. But they, what they call fantasies are simplifying assumptions. Now, funnily enough, I went back to read this paper again when I was putting this put together, and I noticed there was a footnote, footnote 12. The converse of this proposition does not hold. Assumptions that are unrealistic do not guarantee a significant theory. Now, neoclassical economists are so used to making absurd assumptions and calling them simplifying, they've inured themselves to this contradiction. It's almost like a, you know, it's, a, it's like a, a mark of status to make a crazy assumption in a paper. And this has got to be the most crazy assumption in the history of economics. Not because they, there aren't worse assumptions in terms of how logically ridiculous they are. It's that if this one is wrong, we're fucked. Pardon the French, OK? But we are dangerously jeopardising the future of capitalism to make an assumption like this and act upon it as if it's true. And that's largely what's been happening. So what he actually ended up doing, this is, this is Nordhaus, this is a paper by Toll, who's got to be one of the most unpleasant people I've had, to, had dealing with in my history of taking on economists, and that's saying something over 50 years. Uh, but this is the paper from Toll, which is, by the way, is being thoroughly trashed so badly he had to publish a retraction of it, and even the retraction needed a retraction, because he made further errors in it. Uh, for example, uh, just to point out one part of it, this is, he has a paper here, it's, which one is it now? Yeah, he's got a paper here by Nordhaus in 1994, saying there's a three degree temperature increase and the fall is 4.8. That's a, a bigger fall than you saw in some of the other studies. But he got the number wrong. He pulled out the median when he thought he was pulling out the mean. And even Nordhaus didn't notice that Told used the wrong number from his paper. The graphs were badly labelled in the paper as well. It was a total travesty. That was Told's paper and Nordhaus's paper both had what I'd call schoolboy errors in them. But anyway, here's a Mendelssohn one I showed you beforehand, a 2.5 degree temperature increase causing a 1% rise in GDP. So they put it all together and he just used, his damage function is simply a quadratic. It's saying damage is going to be some coefficient, which is what you have to estimate from the data, multiplied by the temperature change over pre-industrial level squared. So these are the 14 data points that Nordhaus fitted his paper to, uh, 2013 version of the manual. It's the same paper he was using uh, at the time of the the same state of the model, I think, as, as he used when he got the Nobel Prize. There's Nordhaus's so-called data point. Those are others that you see in space and time are the same, which is what they're doing here. That's one by Nordhaus in 1994. Okay. And then there's the quadratic fitted to it. Now, the coefficient over time on his quadratic has fallen. It was about 0.3%, about, 0 .3%, um, about 20 years ago, he's reduced it progressively by more and more economic assumptions to 0.00227, which means for a 1% fall in temperature, he's saying GDP will fall by one, less than one quarter of 1%. That's where we are now, roughly, in terms of temperature, not in terms of damage. Two degrees less than a 1% fall, four just over 3.6, even 10 degrees, which is, he says it's outside his parameter range, he has a cutoff point on the function there, but still saying, 10 degrees, 23% fall in GDP, which is trivial. Uh, now, they're only true if those assumptions are true. And here is where my friend Toll comes in. Um, I was trying to provoke one of these bastards on Twitter, Twitter to get this stuff, and Toll beautifully obliged, talk about being caught hook, line and sinker. So in a debate, first of all, where he said I had mischaracterised him as being the author of these studies, and there, which I hadn't done, I said it was a quote in his paper, 
he then let his pants down and started saying things like this in public. 10 K, 10 degrees Celsius, 10, degree, 10 Kelvin, is less than the temperature difference between Alaska and Maryland or Iowa and Florida. Climate is not a primary driver of income. Now this wouldn't matter if it's just an ordinary internet troll. His name's Dan Close. Okay. This is the guy who writes the IPCC reports. Okay? Now a meteorologist, this is what I, was, I was doing this stuff to provoke him so other people could see just how outrageous the work was. And a meteorologist I hadn't met before, actually based in, in, uh, in, Tal in, in Northern California, came across and made this observation. A global climate 10 degrees warmer than present is not remotely the same thing as just taking the current climbing and adding 10 degrees everywhere. It's a widespread misconception. Okay? You can understand people who don't specialise in climate change thinking that, and that's where a lot of the denialism comes from. But somebody who actually wrote IPC author papers, he just he continued digging. You know the old story, if you're in a hole, stop digging? Okay. He was hitting China by the end of the conversation. Climate determinism has no empirical... We observe that people thrive in very different climates. Okay. Now what he's doing is comparing temperature today across the planet. There's no change in the energy level in the biosphere comparing one point today to another point today. It's completely irrelevant to the question we're supposed to be looking at. He says climate determinism has no empirical support. And then, if a relationship does not hold for climate variations over space, you cannot confidently assert that it holds over time. Well, that sounds clever, doesn't it? Okay. It's ignorant of what's called the er ergodicity, the time path of something being totally different, and ignorant, indeed, of the basic statistics here. Because what they did was compare GDP in two locations while the temperature in the biosphere remained the same. And what global warming is going to do is massively increase the amount of energy in the biosphere. That's why I use the analogy of putting a lid on a pot on a stove. Because you can have a stove, you know, you might have a, a small flame and the temperature of the water might be, you know, 50, 60 degrees in the water. A bit of, say, 30, say 30 degrees above what the room temperature would be in the absence of the flames. Because greenhouse gases mean the temperature of the planet's about 30 degrees above of what it would be in the absence of greenhouse gases. The, the background temperature of the planet is about 15 degrees Celsius, roughly, in that range, 13 to 15 degrees. The temperature without global warming gases at all would be the temperature of a sphere as reflective as the Earth is in this location around the Sun at an average of minus 18. Okay, so we're already started at 33 degrees warmer than that, courtesy of the naturally existing greenhouse gases, then we're adding to it. And adding to it, I said, is like putting a lid on that pot on the stove. Now, if you put soup on the stove, you'll get what are called Rayleigh burnout cells forming. They're little, you ever notice the little bubbles that turn up on the top of a, of a pot of stove, a, a pot on the, soup on the stove? Okay, that's a Rayleigh burnout cell. If you put the lid on that, that pot, then the temperature is going to rise. The heat distribution will change. And where those cells are and how broad they are, the pattern will break down. Now, we think about the planet, we have about three main cells. The Hadley cell, which covers the main tropical regions, and two ones further, including the northern polar uh, cells. And they're, at the moment, independent of each other. Now, if you put the lid on the planet, it's quite possible they'll mix. And you might get a uniform temperature over the whole planet, so we can go, you know, for tropical holidays in Antarctica. Okay. And that's what the past looked like in various times but they're completely ignorant of all this stuff. They don't even consider the energy in the planet. So they, they get no information about climate change from the models, the data they use to give policy directions about climate change. So I'm gonna use an example here and show what nonsense they're doing. And I'm gonna make an assumption I know is false, just for the sake of an illustration, that the temperature of any location on the planet is a linear sum of the global temperature, which is what's due to our location in the Goldilocks zone around the sun and the reflectivity of the planet and the pre-existing um, uh, uh, global warming gases, greenhouse gases, and then local deviation, which is pretty much how far you are from the equator. Okay, Just those two. And I'll assume a linear relationship between GDP and temperature as well. So here's my hypothesis. I'm saying GDP per capita is a function of global temperature and local temperature. So I'm going to have alpha 1 times global temperature, which is the deviation from that. Uh, that that's, that's, that's global temperature set by those two first two factors, where we are in the Goldilocks zone plus pre-existing greenhouse gases, plus alpha 2 times the global, the local temperature, which is mainly driven by
by half value away from the equator plus an error term. Now what they effectively did is say, well, here's the situation for Florida. So we've got the global temperature in 1990 or 2000, and that's alpha one times the global temperature plus alpha two times seven, which is the deviation of Florida um, above that, that base temperature, of the America's base temperature. And then there's Dakota, North Dakota, and that's 10 degrees below the average for America. So you subtract one equation from the other, and you get an estimate for the value of alpha two. Okay. But alpha one cancels out. So then if you solve, you've got a value for alpha two. You don't have a value for alpha one. Let's assume alpha one equals alpha two. That's what they're doing, okay? I mean, it's fucking stupid, okay? If any of you did that in a statistical test, the person doing the test should fail you, okay? But that's what they did. Now, it's my little analogy, again, I'm try to get analogies to explain what's going on. It's like having data on the north-south um, slope of a mountain. And you say, oh, it's pretty flat. So you tell hikers it's okay to walk east-west because it's flat, north west south is flat. That works if you're in a very symmetrical land mount. What if you're in El Capitan? And that's the situation that left us in. So, I, and the crazy thing is I have to even waste time proving this stuff is stupid. Okay? And I, I thought when I started taking on mainstream climate change economics, I'd have to dive in and explain why the Ramsey growth model is a bad foundation for modelling a non-equilibrium process. Okay, that sort of thing. I haven't even got there yet. It's just the crazy assumptions they've made in the first place that are wasting my time. So again, one of the reasons they can get away with it, we have no previous experience of a world that that's warm. This is looking, however, at data we now have on the global temperature, average temperature, since the last ice age. That's 20,000 years BC, back there, 20,000 years ago. Um, and the most recent data is going from zero to um, 3,000, 2000, you know, 2000 AD, okay? So zero is JC time, just here. And that's 20,000 before JC. Now we know that at that time, the average global temperature was four degrees below the average from 1951 to 1980. And I can actually point out just how absurd their damage function is, particularly Nordhaus's, because they're symmetrical. A quadratic predicts exactly the same damage for minus four, given that there's no constant or, or uh, linear term in it, that it does for plus four. So I can say, well, about global cooling? What would Nordhaus predict for global cooling? And this is, this, this is where what I'm saying, even climate change deniers should be worried about this because some of them think global cooling is going to happen. Well, okay, what does Nordhaus predict for global cooling? That's his data function, damage function. That's going to by minus 10 degrees down here and plus 10 up there. You can see that the plus minus 10 and plus 10 is 23 degrees, 40 percent, 3 percent GDP. For a four degree fall in temperature, which would reconstruct over time the glaciers that, that covered uh, us during the ice age, 3.6 percent fall in GDP. And now what would the planet look like? Well, this is what it looked like 20,000 years ago. Okay, we'd be below a kilometer of ice. If we're pretty much north of Berlin in Europe, it's gonna be below ice. Everything north of, not everything, but lots of things north of New York, including New York, are gonna be under a kilometer underneath that ice sheet. It's sheer nonsense, okay? Doesn't deserve any respect whatsoever. You cannot extrapolate from the world we're in to that world and say the GDP will fall by 3.6%. You haven't got a bloody clue. It's a different planet, fundamentally. But that's what they're making predictions about. And all of them, not, not uh, Nordhausen's is the worst, which is why they gave him the Nobel Prize. The more garbage you produce, the more likely you are to get a Nobel Prize in economics. Okay. Uh, but there, there's no discontinuity. It's just a quadratic in this thing. And when I went reading, again, I read this stuff and I think, how does this how does this pass muster? The reason is neoclassical economists are reading it. They'll pass anything where you make their preferred assumptions. But rather than assumptions don't matter, it's keep your, keep your dirty mitts off our assumptions is more the way they behave. If you make the assumptions they expect, they'll publish your stuff. Now he, in this, this is not published paper, this is a, a paper on the, um, on, the, on the web which is his manual for the, his DICE model. 
and in it he justified, and this, this is typical of what I find when I go digging into this stuff, it's really bad quality work. The current version of his, his uh, damage function assumes that there are a quadratic function of temperature change and does not include sharp thresholds or tipping points, but this is consistent with the survey by Lenson. Okay. I wanted to see that. I went to the bibliography. There was no paper by Lenton. So I had to go searching on the web, and I found what I thought would be the paper, which duly turned out to be. This is his actual conclusion. Society may be lulled into a false sense of security by smooth projections of global change, which is precisely what Nordhaus was doing. Our synthesis of current knowledge suggests that a variety of tipping points could reach their critical point within this century under, you know, under climate change. That's the exact opposite of what Nordhaus was claiming. And this is typical. They're insulated from the data. Now, why do they ignore them? Well, if you have a discontinuity, an infinite, inf infinite cost at some point, no matter how much you discount infinity, it's still infinity. Okay? So you can't do cost-benefit analysis with it. Now, the climate economists, oh, let's ignore the tipping points then. Let's ignore discontinuities. You might see a recent paper being mentioned by a guy called Kalmadis, I think it is, on the, uh, on the, on the internet, quite regularly promoting it out there, which predicts that if we have a 0 0.04 degree Celsius increase in temperature every year from now until 2100, then the fall in GDP will be 7.22%. Now, I simply burst out laughing when I saw 7.22%. You know. I said, you sure it's not 7.23? And I finally, I was going to ignore it because I've read enough of this garbage so far not to want to read any more, but I thought I'd better take a look. And in it, I'm looking to find, is there any mention of tipping points? This is a paper written in 2019. No mention of tipping points at all. They assume that the damages are a Gaussian distribution. They're ignoring the fact that as we change the base temperature, we, if it is Gaussian, we're moving the mean point. We're going from points where the probability of Amsterdam being three metres under sea level water, which it already is, of course, at the moment, say four, is vanishingly small, to where Amsterdam will necessarily vanish if you put the temperatures up that much. We're changing the entire distribution. They're treating it as if it's static. So the climate scientists said, Let's get rid of cost-benefit analysis. This is Stefan, uh, who uh, works with Lenton as well now. He said, the contemporary way of guiding development founded on theories and tools and beliefs of gradual or incremental change will not likely be adequate to cope with this tragic trajectory. This is politeness from one discipline criticising another. I'm an economist. I can tell you this is garbage. And I want as many of you as possible getting in there and, and taking a look at it and seeing why as well. Now I'm in favour of just abolishing the economic section of the report because the mainstream is so dominant and it's, it's natural for something like the IPCC to approach an organisation like the American Economic Association and ask who are your experts and then approach them and say please come on, bang, who do you select? Not me, I can tell you that. These are some names of people that I know who are doing non-mainstream modelling. Emilio, Emilio, uh, Emmanuel in Austria right now. Tim Garrett I'm working with. Uh, Tim's actually an atmospheric physicist. Gail Girard in France. Matthias Griselli, a mathematician in Canada. Uh, then myself and a couple of them. Lorraine Monsantorato. Have them on the committee as well, which there's Buckley's chance of that. I could suggest it, but it's not going to happen. All these things are not going to occur. So what's happening instead is that known climate change deniers like Bjorn Longborg are using this stuff as data to trivialise things like Extinction Rebellion. So here's him saying, uh, today's Nobel laureate shows optimal solution is moderate to reach 3.5 C, not 4.2 by 2100. Now when I saw the financial crisis coming, my then wife, when I told her in the morning that I saw one was inevitable, she said, what's going to happen to us? And I said, well, you know, if I get the knowledge of a warning of the crisis before it happened, we're going to be in easy street. Okay? That doesn't apply to climate change. This will kill everybody, potentially. I'm not saying it's going to kill everybody. I'm not saying extinction is necessarily going to happen. But with the financial crisis, I managed to do very well out of it in that sense. I, I don't have any chance of making well out of climate change. Okay? We're all going to go down. 
if, if the planet goes, if, if this ecosphere goes down, then so do we. These are some of the damage estimates again. You know, there's uh, zero, look at all the mass, maximum minus 10 type damage. There's a huge level out here. And he's quoting this, stuff. he's quoting the IPC reports. Uh, impact of six degrees is likely equivalent to loss of six to 12 percent of GDP. In a world where we're going to be three to 10 times warmer. Quoting the IPC all the time. So rather than the IPCC, as we know it, because we read, when we read it, what we normally get is the science sections being reported by the science journalists. What the, the, the economists inside who are white-handing the whole process. And his kid striking for climate is rubbishing, um, again, on the same basis, same data. And this is what I really enjoyed. Climate is a problem of nowhere near to extinction. IPC impacts smaller than most other drivers. And he's right. That's exactly what the IPC report says. For most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impact of other drivers. Medium evidence, high agreement. And what are the other changes? Change in population, age, income, technology, relative prices. What does that imply to you, OK? Governance and many other aspects will have a bigger impact on supply and demand that is large relative to the impact of climate change. Who's the author? OK. So that's the super situation we're in. Now, I think I've given you enough to think about and eat a few pizzas over. So what I'm going to do afterwards is talk about alternative approaches to doing that and also show you how to do modelling with my Minsky software as well, which is the sort of thing we have to bring into economics. This garbage only exists because economists have stuck themselves in an equilibrium mindset. And we've got to break away from equilibrium. We can do it today with modern technology. Let's have some pizza. Yeah.